Hey folks, uh, thanks for coming. It's really great to see all of y'all. Um, this is a talk about a project we've been working on for the last, I don't know, six months or so called PF Lua. Does packet filtering with Lua JIT. It's pretty fun stuff. So I, I got to start with, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a story, and then I'll talk a bit about um, packet filtering, and then I'll talk about PF Lua, and then we'll make some forward looking statements that should not be used for investment proposals. Right? So, the, the story in the once upon a time sense is that like networking is, is much like an, another field uh, in which we would go and we would buy like hardware servers and they would come with the operating system that's on it or like a hardware laptop and it comes with its operating system and the problems you can solve you know, with that operating system and on your laptop are the problems that have been conceived of by the maker of your operating system, right? Which is the reason I hate Macs right now because you know, you can only use the, the, the Mac operating system, and you, you can't really do so many new things. Uh, but you know, time passed, uh, and uh, well, so time passed, and uh, what what happened was, uh, you know, you got this you know very flexible operating system with the rise of commodity hardware, and you can solve new problems because you know you have a lot more users, a lot more tinkers, a lot more problems, and a lot more solutions. And the same thing is happening in and networking as well. Like, why is it the case that if I need uh, carrier grade NAT, for example, or I need to address, address family translation, or I need any of these services, why is it that I go and buy a special purpose hardware box that can only do that thing and nothing else, right, from the, from the manufacturer? Why can't we apply the lessons that we've learned from you know, free and open source software and, and, and the kernel, Linux kernel, and the GNU user space and all these things to this high performance networking side? So, that, that's my sort of open question, and and to look at that, you have to well, you have to know a bit about the problem and a bit about the current state of commodity hardware to see if this is a match. So, the, the current status of you know just hardware you can go and buy for a server is, you know, uh, some mid-range Xeon sockets. You can probably get two of them in a normal server. You can probably get 12 to 18 cores on on each socket. And each of those sockets, it will, each of those cores will run at about two gigahertz or so. And in that machine, you can fit a bunch of 10 gigabits per second NICs. Uh, so you can actually you know, handle quite a bit of, um, of traffic through these things. But if you talk about smaller packets, like the 64 bit, uh, 64 byte packets or so, we're looking at a lot of packets per second. So each 10 gigabit per second NIC can do maybe 20 million packets a second for uh, 64 byte packets. And if you look at having you know, a number of these in your, in your machine, you're, you're looking at 100 cycles, which is you know, 50 nanoseconds per packet to process in, in total. So you have about 100 cycles if we're running at about 2 gigahertz or something like that. And if you're running at two uh, instructions per cycle, like uh, very optimistically, then, then you have about 200 instructions in which to do your thing on that packet. So yes, commodity hardware can deal with high performance networking, but the commodity software can't, right? Because the Linux kernel, if you need to be able to actually uh, deal with TCP packets, for example, it's, it's tough to drive it over a million packets a second. I understand, right? So the, the question is, is like, can we, can we think of different ways to do this? Uh, make, it, make an end run around the Linux kernel, uh, do some user space networking, and try to come up with uh, new ways of, of doing high performance networking. And SNAB is such a bet, basically. So. Uh, and, and this is all a story about sort of the context of PF Lua, so excuse me, we are getting to that. Um, SNAB is a high performance networking toolkit uh, that can do many things, which is written in user space as a LuaJIT um, project, basically. It will boot the NIC from user space entirely, uh, so the Linux kernel does not see it at all, and it gets affinity uh, for one core on your system. So if you have, I don't know, 10 NICs in your system, then you're going to allocate 10 cores, you know, one per NIC, servicing those ones. And it's, uh, it works surprisingly well. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting bet uh, and concept, and it seems to be working for folks. And the, the surprising and wonderful thing, uh, for me at least, is that it's just so, so small. Um, the creator of the project, Luke Gorey, started with a budget uh, saying that he's never going to go over 10,000 lines for the core of the project and that it must build within a minute, which is uh, 
really great after working on WebKit, <laughs> so, which, which is the other thing I do for my day job. So it really sort of embraces um, the, the constraints of size and time to produce uh, solutions. And, and how can it produce a solution being so small? Well, it has two secret weapons. One is uh, Lua being uh, a small language that's quite expressive, that you can actually fit a lot of uh, meaning in those 10,000 lines. And it uses Lua JIT as the implementation of Lua, so you can get a lot of performance out of uh, each particular packet. And Lua JIT is great. I, I don't know if you all have had the, the pleasure of playing around with it yet, but it's uh, a small language implementation that produces you know, just world-class performance. In addition, it has a couple of extensions to the Lua language, which are useful when dealing with uh, hardware. For example, you can deal with raw pointers and raw uh, access uh, C libraries if you need to, uh, but the goal is obviously not to do that. So, SNAP, right? LuaJIT, user space networking, a toolkit, meaning you build your app on top of that, and that's where we're getting towards uh, packet filtering. Uh, so if we look at the constraints for this problem, I've got 200 instructions per packet right, to, to do something with this packet. I imagine there's you know, maybe 100 instructions of overhead. You know, we'll, we'll give that to SNAP itself for doing its thing. So I've got about 100 instructions in which to do my thing. And I'm like, well, okay. it's, it's kind of intimidating, <laughs> right? But uh, we'll, we'll see, like, how can, we, how can we eke out this kind of performance uh, with, with LuaJIT? And, and to talk about um, how do we do that, I'm going to make also another little background about packet filtering. Because so I come to this from the compiler's world and not from the networking world. So I, I appreciate any corrections y'all have. And I think y'all have the real experience here. But as far as language implementation, I look at this as like the, how can we make these languages go fast? And the thing to recognize is that packet filtering is a, is a linguistic issue. You don't embed a particular filter in a device unless you're doing um, so, you know, very hard-coded task. And in that case, it's still kind of suboptimal because you can't use that box for anything else. You embed basically a language of some sort. And the user writes a language. and, and causes the, the app to do different things. So they can write in the IP tables language. They can write in the language using the TCP dump supports. Uh, there's going to be a presentation later today about Hakka, another filtering language. But the essence of packet filtering is a kind of linguistic issue. And that's how we, we get here with compilers. Um, so if we look at the language that TCP dump uses, actually, uh, how many of y'all have used uh, TCP dump? No. Oh, OK, you all professional. So, I, well, I mean, we, we know it. It's good, and, 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 it's, and it's bad also. So uh, <laughs> TCP dump is, uses uh, the library called libpcap. And uh, libpcap is what does all the implementation. So that's, that's the, the name I'll use to focus on that. There's not a language given to the, the, a name given that I know of to the language that TCP dump supports. So I call it pflang. And uh, if there's a real name for this language, you know, go ahead and, and let me know. But you know, it needs a name, so that's what it is. So you write like TCP port 80 or IPv6 and UDP, blah, blah, blah. And then it's got a bunch of weird things where you can access uh, contents of, um, of packets. For example, uh, this last one says the four byte value in network order at offset nine of the payload of the TCP packet. So you have to compute like what is the offset of the payload of the TCP packet it being IPv4 or v6. And if the packet isn't that long, then, then actually accessing this fails directly, which is an underdocumented uh, feature of the language. Uh, and, and this language compiles to a bytecode to, for a virtual machine. And the bytecode is called uh, Berkeley Packet Filter Bytecode, BPF. And this uh, bytecode is then interpreted or implemented uh, in some way. I, I don't want to use the, the bad word interpreter. Uh, like, LuaJIT is a language implementation, not a, not a language interpreter, but it does have uh, a, a virtual machine interpreter in uh, libpcap itself to implement the language. So you can get all your packets from the kernel to your library, do your thing, re uh, respond to the kernel. Uh, there is an interpreter as well in the Linux kernel and in the BSD kernels. Uh, so instead of making the trip to user space and back, you can send bytecode to the kernel, and the kernel uh, will interpret uh, your, your code for you. And uh, more recently, there's a just-in-time compilation for BPF bytecode in the Linux kernel and in the BSD kernels. And the Linux kernel actually has a, a couple of versions of, of, of this JIT. So libpcap is, is, a, is, a, is a venerable piece of code. I mean, it's the sort of thing you open it up, and it's got like 
pre ANSI C declarations and the use of the C keyword register. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of a, a scary thing to, to open up on the bad side, right? But on the good side, everyone uses it, you know? So it's super well known and super well deployed. So the goal of, of the PF Lua project is to take the language, the well known, well loved, well understood anyway, language of the PCAP and implement it in a different high performance way. So the, the, the conversation went like this. It's kind of funny. Luke, Luke uh, Gorey, who, who's the head of the SNAB project, uh, was saying on Twitter, I want, I'm tired of libpcap. Does anyone want to implement a JIT for BPF bytecode uh, using LuaJIT's um, uh, DIN-ASM library, which is a library written in C? And I was like, that is stupid. Why don't you just compile that to Lua and let LuaJIT handle it? And I was like, hmm, I should do that. So. <laughs> That's what we did. Uh, this is directly uh, compiled BPF bytecode to Lua. And I sort of made some spaces and added comments uh, where each bit of it corresponds to a bit of bytecode. So for example, here we have 000. This is the, the first bytecode in the BPF. It says, fetch the two byte value at offset 12 in the packet into the accumulator register A. Well, any uh, Temporary registers which the program uses are allocated to local variables in this direct compilation. <coughs> so it's exactly A equals, and then we have uh, we have to byte swap the order because it's in network order. And then LuaJIT, it's it's not so nice to it's it's a bit cumbersome uh, to do. But but here's what it is. And we also have the length check here. So we see each bytecode has you know very directly emitted Lua code, and I mean, I, I stare at this a lot, so I know what it means. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's not terribly bad to understand. Like, the 001 thing is very direct. The only, and BPF is any, any test, you have to have both the true and the false label. So we just allied the, 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 the next one if it's just a fall through. So pretty, pretty simple stuff. And then it keeps on going. And then it keeps on going. And like, there are just more bytecodes. That's about the, the size of it. Uh, uh, of the, of the bytecodes and about the size of the program. But, you know, this, this stuff is kind of, it's kind of crappy, though. I mean, like, the code is just not so great. Uh, and yet, LuaJIT does great on, on this stuff. And I'll show some performance numbers for, for this pipeline uh, a little bit later. And, and, it, and it can do it because uh, Lua has GoTo, which is quite nice for cross-compiling languages. And then LuaJIT has this BitOps module, which allows you to do bit operations, which were somehow excluded from the Lua language until its latest version. Uh, but the perf is good, and Lua JIT just handles it, which was quite surprising to me. At the same time, it's like it could be better. Uh, and there's some impedance mismatches between the language that uh, PFLang has, the language that BPF implements, and the language of Lua. Uh, in particular, uh, numbers in PFLang, you can do an entire arithmetic expressions uh, in PFLang. But the numbers are 32-bit unsigned integers. And this was never really specified, I don't think. It's simply an artifact of the implementation detail that numbers are unsigned 32-bit values in the, in the stock interpreter. And yet Lua's numbers are 64-bit doubles, which contain the set of 32-bit integers. But you know, it's, it's not the same. So you have, to make, sort of, you have to match those up, which can be a bit irritating. And then, I mean, it's, just, it's horrible, right? The, the bit ops module in Lua returns signed 32-bit integers, and you have to make them all math. I, I, it's very, very sad. And, and the other thing is that um, the going from BPF to Lua gives you very little visibility. You just have like one instruction at a time, and unless you reconstruct a, a flow graph from it, you can't do optimizations. Like, you'll find yourself repeatedly checking the length of your packet at every time you access like an offset in the packet. Uh, and you still have to have libpcap around to compile to BPF, so you're not really free of the 90s ball and chain. So the idea is we can do better. Like we can, we can take PFLang and we can compile it directly to Lua. And that's, that's what we did. We implemented a, a parser for this weird language. It's got a lot of really weird cases. We simplify it out to a very uh, minimal intermediate representation. We exhaustively optimize it using shrinking optimizations. And then we just generate some, some better Lua from it. And this is what one of those Lua functions looks like. And I'll explode it out uh, a little bit later to talk about a few of the optimizations we can do. Uh, but having 
this new pipeline gives us the opportunities to do uh, other kinds of optimizations that we couldn't do with the BPF side. So we can do a lot of algebraic simplifications on things. You, you can uh, infer ranges of um, accesses to packets. Uh, you can hoist uh, checks for packet links up higher in the, in the tree of compiler things. Uh, you can fold constants, obviously, uh, and you can eliminate common sub-expressions. The, the thing about it is, like, if you see a phrase like TCP port 80, you're like, where, where is the common sub-expression there, right? But when you expand it all out to the repeated length checks and everything uh, in the more minimal intermediate representation, you can, you can definitely see those. So optimization is necessary. And in fact, uh, libpcap also has an optimizer, which we beat, you know, but it's a necessary thing for, for this compilation. So if we take a look uh, a bit closer to the Lua that we generate, here I sort of commented and, and separated out a few of the blocks. First of all, we see that we've hoisted a length check. Uh, this is, a, again, TCP port 80. So it determined that it's not going to succeed if the packet's not 34 bytes long. So we hoisted that check all the way up to the top. These uh, cast things, um, that uses LuaJIT's FFI to make a pointer, which is actually a heap allocated object in LuaJIT, and then dereference it at a certain offset. Um, that allocation then gets sunk by LuaJIT, so you, that doesn't actually happen at runtime once the, once the trace is compiled. But here we access the, the two byte value in network order directly, and we don't switch it around because we compare it to a constant, so we switch around the constant instead. So instead of comparing to protocol number 2048, we're comparing to protocol number eight because we've done that byte swap already. Um, so then we end up in the, in the nicer case of you know, nested if expressions instead of so many go-tos, but go-tos do exist. Um, accessing flags without byte swapping, is there anything? Yeah, anyway, it, it's, it's something you could, you could stare at a bit more, and I'll, I'll post the slides later if you're curious about the Lua, but it, it, it is what it is. So, uh, we still get to take advantage with this compilation pipeline of LuaJIT. And LuaJIT does basically two things for us that are, are nice, and I would be a bit irritated if I had to implement them again. And one is trace compilation. How many of you have worked with tracing JITs before? A few? So most uh, JIT compilers compile an entire method at a time or an entire function at a time, and so you, you end up with all the branches in the function. A trace compiler compiles only uh, when it decides to uh, compile something. It records all of the branches and all of the checks that are taken along a particular execution trace and then decides to stop somewhere and then writes out linear code for that. So what you end up with is machine code whose linear structure reflects the actual traffic going through your router, which is pretty rad, right? So it seems particularly appropriate for, for tracing JITs. LuaJIT also does register allocation on all the values, so everything stays in registers. Pretty sweet. And uh, since we are using Lua, we use LuaJIT to get around all of the weird dynamic stuff of Lua to basically make those not cost anything for us. So if we use a function like floor, for example, uh, we have to check that, is this really the math.floor operation, or is this some other, the user has done something strange. So LuaJIT helps identify those static subsets of, of Lua and and uh, turns our doubles into integers and, and all that sort of thing. Right, so status of the project. Uh, and, and we have a, a few different parts to look at. I described two pipelines. I described the BPF to Lua pipeline, and I described the sort of native parser pipeline. Um, and the BPF pipeline is great because it's, it's difficult to get wrong. You saw this very direct translation from bytecode to Lua. Um, so if you are really concerned, like you're worried about is our implementation of pflang correct? Is it the same implementation? You can compare it against the BPF one. Or you can uh, use it if our parser is buggy or something. It's not accepting your program, which, I mean, <coughs> software, all these things are possible. So basically, the user can choose which one of these to work. And, and uh, the default one is is the more fun uh, version on the right where we, where we do everything in Lua. And I'm happy to talk about that in questions afterwards. Uh, question is, how's the performance? Well, um, with the caveat that it has not been merged yet into SNAB, because we're waiting on some other things, um, they're trying to use a hyperthread to uh, 
linearize the different IO vex in a packet to one linear buffer, uh, and so concurrently copying that over to hide memory latency, and it seems to be working, and that's just landing now. It's pretty rad stuff. We'll talk more about that. So these are tests which are outside snap switch, and the performance numbers are extraordinarily cache sensitive. Like, does it fit in data cache? Am I blowing my instruction cache? How how does the how do the traces right? So with that big grain of salt, this is uh, packets per second, millions of packets per second processed uh, for a ping flood. And this is just running in user space, having read the PCAP file beforehand, uh, zipping through the 60 megabytes of pings. The first uh, basically measures overhead. It's an accept all filter, so it's, it's nothing. And you would think that all of these would be the same. The, the green bar, the leftmost being libpcap, the next ones being the old and new Linux JITs, respectively, and the next two being the BPF pipeline and then our native PFLang pipeline. Um, you would think these would all be the same, uh, but actually, because there is a cost from going from Lua to the C functions, uh, we, do, we do better in this, which is not a very fair benchmark in any way, but it does say that it's, you know, implementing something directly in Lua uh, gives us an advantage in the SNAP environment. So we're running about 110 million packets a second on a, on a 60 megabyte file of, of a ping flood, which is you know within the budget. The budget being we have to do 20 million packets a second. So in order to give the, the buffer of half of our time for SNAB, we have to really go at 40 million packets a second. Like that's uh, the, the target, and we're exceeding it on all of these. Uh, checking if it's an IP packet, if it's TCP, if it's a TCP port thing, or if it's ICMP. Uh, we're all doing. And these last ones are at uh, 75, which is you know, beating. libpcap is always the lowest. The kernel is a bit more, and then, then we're higher. In a more real-world trace, this is a bunch of traffic that went through my web server. Uh, the accept all packet, for some reason, is going uh, at 200 million, million packets a second, which is totally cache effects there. But it just goes to show that like, it really depends on whether, whether it's in cache or not. So we need to, we need to measure when, when snap comes in. And we do you know, acceptably well on, on, on other workloads. So I'm just going to zip through these, because um, we got you know, a little time constraints here. So challenges, it's tough to be consistent. The traces that get residualized are essentially random in a function of packet flow. And yet, their effect on performance on which traces get residualized or not is not, is not consistent. So it, that's a challenge. Um, Luigit is still doing some stupid stuff and not recognizing that doubles should always be integers in our case. So we can improve Luajit as a future step, or we could actually write our own register allocator. I, I don't know what to do. Uh, compatibility with libpcap, we're mostly complete, I think. I, the, even all the weird operators, we implement them. There are a couple of front end issues we have, but I think nothing in the middle end or the back end. Um, yeah, do we have a correct implementation? Like, this is a new thing. There's probably a bunch of bugs. You want to put it in your router? Well, I advise you to come to Katarina Verona Desi's talk at uh, 2.30 tomorrow the testing dev room, which we talk about our property, uh, randomized property-based testing for, for this thing. And it's uh, going to get in SNAB at some point, I'm pretty sure. And you know, maybe, maybe you can use it too. And you know, as another future step, like PFLang, great, well-known, could be better. I don't know. Uh, it's very 90s, isn't it, though? I mean, you, there's nothing for HTTP, for example. I mean, OK, it's, it's a higher level protocol, but you would, you would, right, this is, these are things you want to filter, right? So uh, could we embed arbitrary Lua functions in there? Could we make more operators or change the language? Uh, these, are, these are new possibilities because we have the language pipeline. So yeah, that's, that's where we're going. Check it out. Build super quick. You can run, make, check. Uh, we do everything on GitHub, file issues, file whatever. Um, check out Snap Switch 2. Drop me a mail. We can work together. So uh, questions? Yes. It's be, uh, so the the question was, why is the performance difference so low uh, when one version does optimizations and one does not? Well, the optimizations are being done as part of the PCAP to an extent, right? Um, but the performance is mostly the same because Luigit will. Um, handle it mostly. And it depends. Like, for example, this last one, the, the difference is 5 million packets a second on a baseline of 35. So 
it's usually better with our native pipeline, but LuaJIT really just kind of does the heavy lifting for us. Yeah. It's a marginal improvement. You're right. Is that the work that we've done on optimizations useless? Is the work on optimizations useless? I don't know. It's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. The question is, uh, why not use a different language, for example, JavaScript? Well, JavaScript has exactly the same numbers as Lua, right? They ha their numbers are 64-bit doubles, and uh, ASM.js is simply a s statically typable uh, subset of JavaScript. And Lua has exactly the same statically typable subset. It's simply that the implementation is lacking in some ways. And so um, the thing to do is to improve uh, Lua JIT, I think, right there. We're we're based on LuaJIT because SNAB is based on it, and we're you know, trying to work in the SNAB universe. So it's kind of a pre-existing thing. But LuaJIT does OK. So yeah. And time is up. Thank you all very much.